world news tonight. Post chaos, the world gets a glimpse on the current situation of orphan Afghan children. Mexico shake up, massive tremors damage infrastructure and cause mass chaos. Olympic suspension, North Korea gets a backhand blow for a no-show at Tokyo 2020. Decorating skies, England witnesses kite magic as enthusiasts flock to perform. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the tensions of the Taliban takeover. A sprawling U.S. air base in the remote part of Germany has become a temporary home for Afghan children separated from their parents during the chaotic evacuation from Kabul airport. And officials are scrambling to reunite them with their families. Unaccompanied Afghan children clapped along to a soldier playing the ukulele at a remote U.S. airbase in Germany. Some kids played catch, others played with whatever they could find. Ramstein Air Base has become their temporary home, along with hundreds of other children who have been separated from their parents after a chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Kabul. UNICEF said it has registered around 300 separated and unaccompanied children linked to the evacuations from Afghanistan, with some ending up in Germany and Qatar, and officials are scrambling to reunite them with their families. One U.S. State Department official said some cases can be solved quickly. If the parents got onto a different plane or are already at Ramstein or in the U.S., adding that cell phones help speed up reunification. What you've done, what you've accomplished, uh, in such a short period of time, under such extreme circumstances, is truly, truly remarkable. On Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressed the staff at the base's so-called youth pod to learn more about the reunification efforts. There's some extraordinary children here uh, who I think will find a great place in America and will count on your continued engagement on bringing families together. Blinken also met with a small group of newly arrived Afghan refugees at Ramstein Air Base, where some 12,000 evacuees are still living in tents and in other U.S. barracks nearby. The rest have moved on to the United States or other safe locations. While the chaos continues in Afghanistan, diplomats of the country are stating that Kabul's former government was at fault for the start of the Taliban rule. One in particular saying the takeover was horrifying, but of no new surprise. A former Afghan envoy to Washington blames Kabul's former government for the country's Taliban takeover, accusing them of widespread corruption. That echoes sentiments from current and former U.S. officials for years. Roya Ramani served as the country's first female ambassador to the United States, leaving her post of three years in July. In an interview in Washington, D.C., she said that it was mismanagement by Afghanistan's leaders that led to the Taliban to take over so quickly. The U.S. government has indicated that they were met by surprise. Uh, I, as an Afghan, was not surprised by the fact that the Taliban took over Afghanistan the way they did. It was the leadership that was corrupt. And uh, they uh, handed over basically the, the country to the Taliban and, and their actions led to that. In particular, she expressed disappointment at Ashraf Ghani for abandoning the presidency. That was the only thing that surprised me, in fact, that I had at least better expectation from him, not from him alone, not from his aides, because, but I could also see that the same way that he made all the other decisions, the same way that he outsourced the matter of the country just to his uh, two aides or three aides, uh, this, this would be the consequences. Ghani said on Wednesday he left because he wanted to avoid bloodshed. He denied allegations he stole millions of dollars on his way out. Ramani also warned of massive geopolitical shifts coming for Washington and its allies. The Taliban have vowed to be more tolerant compared to their last time ruling Afghanistan. However, Ramani cautioned that dark times lay ahead for women there. She points to the Taliban's decision on Tuesday to exclude women from all top government positions. <coughs> Women-led protests following that announcement were cut short after Taliban gunmen fired into the air to disperse the hundreds that rallied. I salute 
all the brave women of Afghanistan. It is quite risky to do what they are doing. And it's also uh, an indication to the rest of the world that they have everything to lose uh, at this point. Foreign countries greeted the makeup of the new government in Afghanistan with caution and dismay after the Taliban appointed hardline veteran figures to top positions, including several with a U.S. bounty on their heads. They said their government would be inclusive. Weeks after the Taliban took over Afghanistan, their first caretaker government is all male. Many of its members are linked to the old hardline guard. The U.S., EU and NATO countries met to discuss what they could still do now that they have left Afghanistan. We also discussed how we will hold the Taliban to their commitments and obligations to let people travel freely, to respect their basic rights, including women and minorities, to ensure that Afghanistan is not used as a launching pad for terrorist attacks. Afghanistan's neighbors met by video conference, with several of them calling to work with the Taliban to help them or press them to keep terror groups out. We welcome the Taliban's positive attitude towards political construction, anti-terrorism and relations with neighboring countries after entering Kabul. But the key is to put them into practice. Pakistan, who has taken in many Afghan refugees, says the key priority is to bring stability. If a humanitarian crisis is prevented and economic stability is assured, then peace can be consolidated and a mass exodus precluded. Averting a humanitarian crisis is also the priority for the UN, who is demanding that the Taliban guarantee security for its teams and aid workers from across the world. The European Parliament Subcommittee on Human Rights is urging countries to support women and girls' rights in Afghanistan. For further details on this, we now cross over to Aladar World News Pressure Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani. Yes, Shirali. Meeting at the European Parliament in Brussels, MEPs focused on the risks and said there is a need for concern, but no need for alarmism in a way. The EU's envoy to Afghanistan has said the bloc has to make sure that the moderate forces within the Taliban prevail weeks after the extremist group took over the country. When taking over the country, Taliban officials ensured that women would be allowed to work and travel without a male escort. But MEPs warn that the Taliban will have to be judged by their deeds. The head of the EU delegation to Afghanistan also added that there are negative things happening. Afghan women's rights defenders disagreed with the ambassador's assessment and called for the EU not to be complicit in human rights abuses by turning a blind eye. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. A powerful earthquake struck Mexico's Apalcars late, killing at least one man and damaging buildings, including the control tower at the Beach Resorts International Airport. This was the moment a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck southwestern Mexico on Tuesday. The powerful quake killed at least one person, according to authorities. The quake hit 11 miles northeast of the beach resort of Acapulco, downing trees, pitching boulders onto roads and causing power outages in several states. Tourists evacuated from hotels as aftershocks hit. In Mexico City, lights went off and residents huddled together in the rain, holding young children and pets. Guillermo Ramirez was enjoying a play in the theater when he heard an alarm and evacuated with other members of the audience. The actors stood still. They froze and they started to get people out to evacuate the theater. And in the lobby, I felt very dizzy, going back and forward. We headed out slowly towards the street and I saw a lot of cars in the street while swaying without stopping. Les informo. President Andres Manuel López Obrador told the nation that the earthquake had not caused major damages. Registro. The U.S. Geological Survey said Tuesday's quake was relatively shallow, 
just 12 miles below the surface, which would have amplified the shaking effect. Mexico's state power utility said in a statement that 1.6 million users had been affected by the earthquake in Mexico City and the adjacent states. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. North Korea, the only country that did not send athletes to the Tokyo Olympic Games, has now been banned by the International Olympic Committee from competing until the end of next year. The suspension covers the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics. The IOC has decided to ban North Korea from competing at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympic Games, punishing the country for its Tokyo Games no-show. Therefore, uh, the IOC <coughs> executive board addressed this uh, situation and uh, decided uh, today that uh, the uh, National Olympic Committee of uh, the Democratic People's uh, Republic of uh, North uh, Korea is uh, suspended until uh, the end of uh, the year 2022. As a result of uh, its uh, unilateral decision not to participate in the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020. The committee explained that the North Korean Olympic Committee would not receive financial support during the suspension period and would definitely forfeit support that had previously been withheld due to sanctions. However, it added that the IOC did reserve the right to make decisions regarding individual North Korean athletes who qualify for the 2022 Winter Games. North Korea was the only country of some 200 competing nations that did not send athletes to Tokyo, citing the need to protect its athletes from COVID-19. To this, the IOC says it had warned the country of the consequences of not participating. While Seoul had hoped that the upcoming Winter Games would serve as an opportunity to re-engage in dialogue with the North, it's left to be seen whether this would be possible due to the IOC's latest decision. The long-awaited trial of the suspects in the November 2015 Paris terror attacks opened at the Palace of the Justice in the French capital with 20 accused of the worst post-war atrocity on French territory. Let's cross over to other than a world news pressure correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. For more, Chetan. Yes, Shanali. 14 of the accused were in the court to answer the suicide bombings and gun assaults that killed 130 people outside the Stade de France Stadium, as well as in bars, restaurants and the Batlon music venue on November 13, six years ago. Of the six tried in absentia, five are presumed dead. The trial will last nine months, an unprecedented length for a criminal hearing in France. It involves some 1,800 plaintiffs and some more than 300 lawyers. Speaking early in the day, Prime Minister John Castex reiterated his government's determination to do everything possible to curb the terrorist threat. Some French experts in anti-terrorism staked out the concerns about the remained threats from domestic terrorists, as the French youth nowadays have shown a dangerous tendency to slip in extremism. According to the data from the French Ministry of Interior, President Macron, with his strong anti-terror law has successfully contained 36 plots of terror attacks yet failed to prevent 14 attacks from happening in the country since he took power in 2017. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was other than a world news pressure correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Kamala Harris has taken to the political stage yet again now in California as she campaigned against Republican recall on behalf of Governor Gavin Newsom. This recall campaign is about California and it's about a whole lot more. Vice President Kamala Harris stumped for California Governor Gavin Newsom on Wednesday, part of a ramped up effort to save his job from a Republican led recall by bringing in some of the Democratic Party's biggest names. They're thinking that if they can get this done in California, they can go around the country and do this. You gotta understand what's happening right now. What's happening in Texas, what's happening in Georgia, what's happening around our country with these policies that are about attacking women's rights, reproductive rights, voting rights, workers' rights. 
They think if they can win in California, they can do this anywhere. Well, we will show them you're not going to get this done, not here, never. Harris, a former U.S. senator from the state and a longtime ally of Newsom, appeared with the governor in San Leandro near her childhood home of Oakland. She painted the recall, which is backed financially by state and national Republican groups, as part of a broader Republican effort to oust Democrats from power across the country. We are also in this election making a statement about who we are as a nation. Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one in the state, and a recent poll by the Public Policy Institute of California showed that 58 percent of likely voters opposed recalling Newsom. But complacency among Democrats could tilt the election toward Republicans, who are more motivated to vote by their opposition to Newsom's progressive policies on immigration and crime and his handling of the pandemic, during which he implemented mask and vaccination mandates, moves that have angered some conservatives. This election is a choice about life and death. President Joe Biden is also expected to campaign for the governor ahead of the recall election on September 14th. Hong Kong police arrested four members of a pro-democracy group that organized the annual June 4th rally to commemorate those who died in the bloody 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. Four arrests in Hong Kong on Wednesday dealt a new blow to the city's opposition movement. Those detained are all members of the pro-democracy group that organizes a yearly vigil in Hong Kong for the bloody crackdown in Tiananmen Square. The June 4th event commemorates those killed when China quashed 1989's student-led protests. Activist and barrister Chao Hang Tong was arrested along with three others from the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements in China. A day before her arrest, Chow spoke to reporters outside police headquarters. She had been at the headquarters to deliver a message to officers that the alliance would not provide the information they had requested. Last month, police had sent a letter to the organization giving it until Tuesday this week to provide details of its membership finances and activities. The letter accused the alliance of being an agent of foreign forces, adding that failure to comply with the deadline could result in a fine and six months in jail. Alliance leaders Albert Ho and Lee Chuck Yang are already in jail over their roles in anti-government protests that roared the city in 2019. The National Security Department said that investigations were ongoing and did not rule out further arrests. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro slammed the country's Supreme Court and cast doubt on the integrity of next year's election as his supporters and critics rallied in major cities at a time of heightened tensions in Latin America America's largest democracy. Supporters in Brazil's capital cheered as President Jair Bolsonaro spoke on Tuesday to mark the country's Independence Day. He mostly criticized the country's Supreme Court. It's authorized investigations into Bolsonaro and his allies and has resisted his attempt to introduce new voting laws into next year's election, which he says is vulnerable to fraud. But Bolsonaro's critics contend he's sowing doubts in the country's democracy. And opinion polls now show him losing dramatically to former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who has yet to confirm his candidacy. Crowds for and against Bolsonaro hit the streets across Brazil on Tuesday in cities like Brasilia, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Security forces were deployed to control the crowds of supporters in Brasilia, some of which have vowed to occupy the Supreme Court in a protest modeled after the assault on the U.S. Capitol by supporters of then-President Donald Trump. In Sao Paulo, anti-Bolsonaro protesters called for the end of his presidency. They also voiced concerns over Bolsonaro's handling of the global health crisis, holding signs calling him genocidal. Meanwhile, in the same city, his supporters marched to remove Supreme Court justices. Bolsonaro's long-standing support among the police and military has fueled concerns that uniformed officers could take part in demonstrations or fail to contain potential attacks on government buildings. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
The European Union has urged North Korea to embark on a credible path towards completing denuclearization and to immediately comply with all relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Small business owners in South Korea once again took to the streets in protest against the government's social distancing rules. The protest took to the form of a drive through rally where business owners demanded changes to current social distancing rules and are based on types of facilities and not individual businesses. During his visit to Tehran, the Qatari foreign minister is scheduled to meet with his Iranian counterpart at the Foreign Ministry of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Qatari official will probably meet with a number of other officials of the Islamic Republic of Iran during his trip. Foreign ministers from some 20 countries gathered online to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. The meeting was co-hosted by U.S. State Secretary Antony Blinken and German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas and was attended by South Korea, the U.K., the Qatar and amongst others. Spain's Coast Guard rescued 34 African migrants in the Atlantic Ocean and transported them to the port of Gran Canary. The migrants arrived at the port where they were met by members of the Red Cross and police officers who registered their arrival. And finally tonight, a sky full of colour invited viewers at St Anne's Beach in England as kite enthusiasts put on a show for the masses drowning any disappointed from last year's cancellation of the event. Flying kites were displayed in the sky at St Anne's Kite Festival in England and also capturing floating creatures of all shapes and sizes such as bears, lizards and fish filling the sky over St Anne's Beach. The St Anne's Kite Festival returned to Lancashire after last year's cancellation. The beautiful array of different engineered kites took high into the skies with families and enthusiasts watching on, enthralled after last year's setback. The festival is to return next year as well, with many already preparing grander creations than the last. Despite the pandemic raging on, participants were able to safely enjoy the view on the beach thanks to distancing guidelines. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.